morning. If you have your Bible, please open with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at the first six verses, but I'm only going to read verses 1 and 2 at the beginning of the message, which is entitled, War of the Ages. Revelation chapter 12. Now the month of February is known for three things. First of all, this year, the Super Bowl. Secondly, President's Day, a week from tomorrow. And third, Valentine's Day, a week from today. So no mail that is in the service today has any excuse to neglect Valentine's Day. But next Sunday morning, I'm going to bring a message on love, marriage, and the home. And then after that, the following week, we'll resume our series as we preach through the book of Revelation. Now chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. There have been multitudinous wars in human history, so many that we could never count them. One of the most unusual and one of the worst during the Middle Ages was called the War of the Cow. A peasant from a Belgian village walked to a neighboring village to attend a fair. While there, he stole somebody else's cow. The owner of the cow witnessed the crime, followed the peasant back to his own village, and met the peasant's feudal lord and said, Your servant has stolen my cow. So a deal was reached that if the peasant would return the cow, then the owner and his village would forgive the transgression. So the peasant took the cow to the neighboring village and returned it. But the leadership of the neighboring village broke their word, arrested the peasant, and hanged him for stealing a cow. Because of theft on the one hand and lying, breaking the word on the other hand, a war erupted the war of the cow. It lasted three years, and in those three years, 20,000 people died. World War I. I have a grandfather who fought in that war. It was supposed to be the war to end all wars. That didn't happen. Many of you remember the first Gulf War which Saddam Hussein called the mother of all wars. And I think that was a little bit of an exaggeration. It was a war, but it wasn't the mother of all wars. There is the greatest war of all of time and eternity being fought on a spiritual plane between an almighty and loving God, and a malevolent, rebellious devil. That's the war of the ages about which we're going to talk in Revelation chapter 12. Now, we see in Revelation a number of series of sevens. There were the seven churches to whom John wrote. There were the seven seals broken, and with each seal a judgment came. We have studied seven trumpets sounding, and with each one a trumpet judgment. We are going to study seven bowls of wrath 
poured out upon the earth, the seven bowl judgments. But in between the seven trumpet judgments and the seven bowl bold judgments, there is another series of seven here in chapters 12 and 13. Seven great personalities, seven great personages. First of all, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, there is a woman who is robed in the sun. Secondly, in verses 3 and 4, there is a great red dragon who wants to devour the woman's forthcoming baby. Third, in chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, the baby is born, the man-child. Fourth, beginning in verse 7, there is Michael, the archangel. Fifth, in chapter 12, verse 17, there is the remnant of the woman's offspring. Sixth, in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, there is a beast out of the sea. We call him the Antichrist. And seventh, in chapter 13, verse 11, there is another beast out of the land, and we call him the false prophet. These seven personalities. But the first three of these that we're going to study this morning talk about this conflict. It's a conflict which began before the world was ever created. It's a conflict which will reach its culmination in a time of tribulation upon the earth that John is describing. But you and I live in the midst of the conflict even today, the war of the ages. Now notice first of all the first personality to whom we're introduced. The woman in chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. John says, A great sign appeared in heaven. A sign points to something else. Like a sign in a store will tell you which aisle to go to or will tell you the price of an item or a sign by the roadside will give you a distance or a speed limit or a highway number or a direction. Here is a sign that points to something else. Who is this woman that John describes? Well, some have said she is Mary since Mary gave birth to a man-child. Nobody respects Mary more than I do. But I do not believe this woman is Mary. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says that this woman goes into the wilderness for a period of three and a half years and there she is protected by God. Nothing like that ever happened to Mary. Then there are those who say this woman represents the church. Nobody reveres or honors the church more than I. And yet I don't believe this woman is the church. The church does not give birth to the Messiah, the man-child. It is the Messiah who gives birth to the church. So who is this woman clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet, and twelve stars upon her head? She is Israel, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. In Romans chapter 9, Paul talks about the Israelites and he says, from them came the Christ. It was Israel who brought the Messiah into the world. Not only that, you can see Israel in the description of this woman. In the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis, Joseph comes to his brother, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, 
And Joseph says to them, I had a dream. And in the dream, my father, jo Jacob, my mother, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, my 11 brothers, were bowing down before me, the 12th brother, the 12th star. So in the Old Testament, the 12 stars represent the nation of Israel. And here, John borrows from that image. And he says, I saw a woman. And the woman represents Israel who brings the Christ, the man-child, the Messiah into the world. Do you realize that Israel herself is a miracle of God? Israel is going to be here until Jesus comes again. One day a man said, I can prove the inspiration of the Bible in two words. And someone said, what are those two words? And he answered, the Jews. God called Abraham and founded the Jewish nation. And God said to Abraham, from here on, in your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And whoever blesses you, I am going to bless. And whoever curses you, I am going to curse. And that has been played out throughout history. Anytime a nation has persecuted the Jewish people, God has brought judgment upon that nation. Whether it was in the book of Esther, when the Persian nation planned to exterminate the Jews, whether it was in Nazi Germany, whether it was in the former Soviet Union, any nation that persecutes the Jewish people, Israel is going to come under the judgment of God. Our nation, more than any time in its history, needs God. Our nation, probably more than any time in its history, does not deserve God. The worst thing our nation could do to commit national suicide is to turn our backs on the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. God said, this is my earthly people. They are going to be here until Jesus comes again. And I look around and I see that fulfilled. Show me a Moabite. You can't do it. Show me a Hittite. You can't find one. Show me an Ammonite. They no longer exist. They were all here in Bible times. But I can show you a Jew. He was here in the time the Bible was written. He has been miraculously preserved through the centuries. He will be here when Jesus comes again. The radiant woman, the Jewish nation. Now the second sign that John sees in verses 3 and 4 is a great red dragon. And I saw another sign in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. There is the eternal war between the dragon and the Christ. Who is the dragon? He is Satan. Look down at verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan. Why is he red? Because red, historically, is a color of death and war. Why 
does he have seven heads and ten horns? The Antichrist in chapter 13 is going to have seven heads and ten horns. Now the Antichrist is a human political figure. But he's going to operate under the control of Satan. He is Satan's superman. Seven heads, ten horns. And notice the seven crowns. The word for crown is not the word Stephanos, which is the term used in the Bible for the crown given to the Christian at the judgment seat of Christ. The Greek word is diademata, a diadem. It's a crown of governmental authority, Satan's authority over his kingdom. And with his tail, he sweeps a third of the stars of heaven. Verse 9 tells you who those stars are. And the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So those stars are the demons, they are the angels of Satan. The origin of Satan is shrouded in mystery. But I gather from Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14 that originally he was an unfallen angel. Ezekiel calls him the anointed cherub who covers. One of the cherubim whose responsibility it was to stand in the presence of the throne of God in heaven. But Ezekiel says his heart was lifted up in pride. And Isaiah tells us that he said, I will be like the Most High. Now it's wonderful to be like the Most High in your character. But that's not what Lucifer meant. He meant I will be like the Most High in that I will be God. I will be independent of any other authority. And so he was cast out of heaven. And the angels who followed him were cast out of heaven. And we believe that's the origin of demons, fallen angels. So that's where the conflict began before the universe as we know it was ever created. Then Satan made his entrance into human history. God planted a garden. Eden, and created in that garden a man and a woman. By the way, Adam and Eve were in a perfect environment, and yet when tempted, they fell. Don't ever think that we can give everyone an education, give everyone a fair start in life, give everybody equal income, and wind up solving the problems of society. We can't do it. The problems of society begin in the human heart. They don't begin in external circumstances. But Satan came to Adam and Eve and tempted them, and they fell, and so the eternal battle between God and Satan continued. It continued during the life of Christ. When Jesus was born as a little baby, King Herod decided, I'm going to devour the child, put him to death. But an angel of God warned Joseph. So Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus fled into the land of Egypt. The battle continued. Later on, Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness and tempted our Lord three times. The battle continued continued. During our Lord's earthly ministry, time and again he confronted those who were possessed by demons. The battle continued. One day Jesus said to the Pharisees in the 8th chapter of John, 
the 44th verse. You are of your father, the devil. He is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. If you ever want to be like the devil, all you have to do is be a liar. You know, someone has said that the two biggest lies told in our world today are, number one, the check is in the mail, and number two, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. All you have to do is to tell a lie and you have imitated the behavior of Satan. And then the cross when Jesus died, the battle continued. Even after Jesus arose and ascended into heaven, in the lives of our Lord's apostles, the battle continued. Satan prompted Ananias and Sapphira to lie to the Holy Spirit and Peter confronted them in the fifth chapter of Acts. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. In 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul said, I wanted to come to see you many times, but Satan hindered us. Sometimes when we are hindered, it's not that God said no. Sometimes Satan hindered us. Sometimes when we're afflicted, it's not because God is doing this to me. It's because Satan is afflicting us as he did Job in the Old Testament. The battle continues. Jesus said, when the sower went forth to sow, some of the seed was scattered by the wayside and the birds came and snatched it up. And Jesus said, that's some of the seed when my word is proclaimed. The devil comes and takes it away lest they believe. It's often the devil who snatches up the seed of the word of God and prevents an unbeliever from trusting in Christ as Savior. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus said it was the devil who, saw, who sowed the weeds in God's wheat field. So the battle continues. If you're not a Christian... The devil is interested in keeping you from Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine upon them. And if you're a Christian, the devil is interested in you. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he continues, put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of the gospel of peace and uh, lift up the shield of faith, put on the helmet of salvation, take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and pray always. You and I are engaged in a spiritual conflict. And if you try to fight spiritual battles with physical means, you are destined to be defeated every time. You can only win spiritual battles by spiritual weapons like the Word of God and faith and prayer and the gospel. So the dragon represents Satan. A man who had been captured by alcohol was wonderfully converted. And uh, someone said to him, I see you have mastery over the devil. The man said, no, I don't have mastery over the devil. I have found the master of the devil. Jesus is stronger than Satan and you can overcome through his power. Now briefly, the third sign in verses 5 and 6, the man-child, the Lord Jesus Christ. John writes, she, Israel, 
gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. He's saying that Jesus is going to come and Jesus is going to be king. The Bible says the trumpet is going to sound and Jesus is going to come and Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. Can any of you remember when there was a famous trumpet player in New Orleans by the name of Al Hurt? I remember. Did you know that on one occasion a man came to Al Hurt and he said, You are fantastic. You are the second greatest trumpet player in the world. And Al Hurt said, The second? Who is the first? The man said, Gabriel. And Al Hurt said, I've never heard of him. And the man said, you will. Everybody's going to hear about Gabriel when he blows that trumpet or whichever angel blows the trumpet. But the Bible says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Notice the gap that the child is born. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He was caught up to God in heaven. A gap of at least 33 years. No reference to his life on earth. No reference to his death on the cross or his resurrection. He was born. He was caught up to God in heaven. Why? Did you know God is not limited by time? To God, everything is in present tense. But also here, the emphasis is not on the life of Christ. Not even on the death of Jesus. Here the emphasis is on the exaltation and the reign of Jesus. So John says, yes, he was born. Unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born. The child is born. There's the humanity of Jesus. The son is given. There is the deity of Jesus. When Jesus was in heaven, he had a father but no mother. When Jesus was up on earth, he had a mother but no father. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And John says this son is going to rule and reign. He is victorious. Do you belong to the child, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, you can give him your allegiance and your devotion today. In just a moment, we're going to sing together a hymn of invitation. And as we sing, we invite you to respond to the appeal of the Holy Spirit. I, as a minister, make an appeal. This church, as a congregation, issues an invitation. But the real invitation is the appeal of the Holy Spirit of God urging you to give your life to Christ and trust Him as your Savior. Or if you'd like to come today and join First Baptist by moving your membership, or come today in recommitment of your heart and your life to the will of God, we invite you to come. Let's stand together. Let's sing together. And as God calls, come just now.